。所以下一个我们要想请那个呃中国人那、呃、个人权观察香港的这个主任，刚才这个索菲律师，他对这个香港一直非常有研究。我们刚才是从六四到反送中，也就是反送中，大家都知道，就是香港的一个话题。所以现在我想请我们苏菲律师给大家做这方面的主题演讲，谢谢。Thank you so much, Fang Zhen. First, let me make sure that you can hear me, all right? Yes. Great, terrific. Um, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to join you, Fang Zhen. You are one of my heroes. And I am very grateful to you and to Ken Chan and Alex Chow for inviting me to join you. I'm very sorry I'm not there with you,、uh, since it's obviously a very lively crowd.、Um, I also just want to clarify: I'm actually now a visiting scholar at Stanford. I'm not with Human Rights Watch anymore. I just want to make sure that my remarks、uh, are, are seen as they are, which are mine.、Um, But the first, most important point that I want to make, that I think follows on the wonderful presentation that we just heard, is how important it is to honor all of the survivors, the family members, the historians, the writers, the photographers, the students, all of the people who participated in the movement, not just 35 years ago, but who have spent their lives keeping that event alive and trying to document. And really hold leaders accountable for what happened、uh, in 1989. Ken asked me to just share a few particular reflections about the relationship between 1989、uh, in the mainland and in Hong Kong. Oh, sorry. Just want to make sure you can still hear me.、Um, I actually first visited Hong Kong and the mainland in August of 1989 when I was a teenager in college. And you know, I think the 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 enormous changes in 1989. There were still massive peaceful protests in Hong Kong that the police would protect.、Uh, in 1989, the Legislative Council in Hong Kong was not fully democratic, but it was certainly much more democratic than any institution、uh, within the mainland. There was a thriving civil society in Hong Kong. Church groups, labor unions, civic organizations, volunteer groups that helped out people in communities that needed a little extra assistance. It was an extraordinary place、uh, in that respect. There was a free press,、uh, a very lively one,、uh, and it was the place where people who were trying to seek some safety but continue to work for. Accountability and democracy and human rights went to from the mainland to try to be free, and it was the place where the rule of law actually prevailed, where an independent professional court system could deliver non-political verdicts in support of the rule of law and human rights. Fast forward 35 years, and we have a place where not only can you not have large-scale protests. Most of, if not all, of the organizations that made Hong Kong such a distinct place have now had to disband、uh, for fear of prosecution. The being in the Legislative Council now requires being patriotic,、uh, in the sense that Xi Jinping defines it, and the Chinese Communist Party define those terms. Many of the wonderful, extraordinary mainland and Hong Kong journalists who were working from Hong Kong have now left,、uh, and many of the outlets that they worked for have closed down. It's now a place that puts bounties on、uh, activists who are outside the territory. People like Anna Kwok、uh, and Ted Hoy, and Hong Kong now has. I find this most. Uh, distressing and disgraceful. Hong Kong has political prisoners, just like in the mainland, and some of those people are individuals like Lei Chukyan, the longtime labor activist who pressed long and hard and loudly and peacefully for accountability for June Fourth, and people like Chao Hung Tung, who helped organize the longtime Tiananmen vigils, which were absolutely a defining feature. Of Hong Kong's political and social and human rights life, the fact that that occasion can no longer be marked in the territory, except in the most private ways that the authorities can't see, 
is a powerful statement about what Hong Kong is like now as opposed to 35 years ago. I think we should reflect for a few minutes on how we got here. It's a long story, and I don't think we need to go into all of the details, but I think that the impunity that the Chinese leadership enjoyed in 1989, that you know, senior leaders weren't investigated, they weren't prosecuted, that nobody was ever held accountable, that the victims and survivors have had to go 35 years without justice. And that was the moment at which the kind of impunity that Xi Jinping has enjoyed started. Uh, you know, and under his rule since uh, late 2012, I think human rights across the board have deteriorated significantly, not just in Hong Kong, but whether we're talking about you know, the, the minor progress that had been made in the mainland legal system, all of those reforms have been rolled back. And I think it's fair to say that you know, it's virtually impossible to get a fair trial, particularly if you're trying to challenge the government. Uh, that you know, we're watching the authorities continue to commit some of the worst crimes under international human rights law, targeting, for example, Uyghurs and Tibetans. Uh, the rollbacks of women's rights uh, and other communities that have fought for equal status and made some modest gains, we're watching all of that uh, get rolled back. And the particular problems in Hong Kong did not just start with the Chinese government's proposed uh, extradition legislation in 2019 that would have allowed people in Hong Kong to have to face trial in the mainland, and that was what prompted massive protests. But then the adoption in 2020, and then again recently, of national security laws that give the authorities sweeping powers to prosecute people uh, for speech, for conduct, uh, for all sorts of behavior that's absolutely protected by international human rights law that still applies in Hong Kong. So it's not just that we're seeing one or two people prosecuted for criticizing the central government, it's that we're seeing the judicial system as a whole start acting, I uh, mean the Hong Kong judicial system, start acting uh, like its counterparts in the mainland. Also, we have to pay attention to the fact that the, the, the current Chinese government's uh, tendency to try to harass and silence its critics beyond borders is a problem that's getting worse, uh, not better. And I'm sure there are people in the room in San Francisco there who have experienced this kind of harassment. You know, you're a long way away from the mainland. You're in a country where your rights should be protected. And yet I'm sure there are people uh, who have found themselves targeted by Chinese authorities. I think there's an enormous amount of work to be done in the spirit of June 4th to continue pressing for accountability, to continue to defend all of those who are fighting for their rights, the people in the room with you, the Tiananmen mothers, the blank paper protesters, the groups from Hong Kong that have reconstituted themselves in the US, in the UK, in Australia, all around the world to try to continue to protect rights. Those are the people that we need to keep supporting and we have to make sure that Xi Jinping does not rewrite history so that Tiananmen is forgotten. In other words, I think vigils like this, gatherings like this, discussions of history and politics like this are essential because remembering is resisting. It is a form of power. And I will simply close by recalling the marvelous uh, comment made by a student on a bicycle in Beijing, it was captured by the BBC, and he was asked in 1989 why he was going to the protests. And the sense was, you know, why would you engage in something that's difficult politically and might be problematic when you could be safe on your campus studying, looking forward to, to a safe and secure future? And with a huge smile, this young man turned to the camera and he said, Yingaida, it's our duty. It's my duty. It's your duty. It's all of our duty to not forget June 4th, 1989. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie.